بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to bless his entire household May Allah bless them all his companions, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every single one of us as well. My brothers and sisters, the month of Ramadan is a month wherein many of us become more charitable than we are outside the month of Ramadan. Perhaps one of the reasons may be that the reward in the month of Ramadan is multiplied. And therefore, people would like to hope and wish that by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they were to be charitable in the month of Ramadan, perhaps, mashallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be more pleased. Let's remember one thing. If a person happens to delay an act of charity that is due before Ramadan or that is necessary or needed before Ramadan because they would like a bigger reward in Ramadan, then that is wrong. The reason is if it is needed and required, we need to give it as and when it is needed. And by the will of Allah, Allah knows the intention. He will give us a greater reward. There is no point in seeing a man dying of starvation and telling him, wait for Ramadan, then I will give you a charity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. However, when it comes to charities, there are several types of people. Some people are balanced, mashallah, and that is a mu'min. A true believer is supposed to be balanced. You know your income, you know how much you've saved, and you give what is due, and you give more than what is due for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That which is zakah is compulsory, and that which is beyond zakah, voluntary, that too we should be giving. Make sure that the amounts are quite handsome by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there are some who don't give. They seem to just stick to whatever they have. They keep it. They find themselves miserly. And they find it difficult even to calculate that which is just two and a half percent of their zakah, their, their compulsory charity, so to speak. And then you have those who are so generous that they give away even what they need themselves. So sometimes you have a piece of clothing, subhanAllah, it's covering you. And the next best thing, you've taken it out and given it to someone else. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us achieve a balance. Remember, there is a narration that appears uh, of Jabir radiallahu anhu in some of the books of tafsir, uh, where he speaks about some of the companions who used to give so much that they used to later on have to go and search for some of their own basic necessities. And there is one narration where it is mentioned of the Prophet ﷺ himself, out of his generosity and his care for others, there was a man who came to him and requested something, so much so that he requested a piece of clothing. And the Prophet ﷺ, according to one narration, gave him a piece of clothing that was needed by the Prophet ﷺ. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us all as a result to strike the correct balance. Let's listen to the verse. Verse number 29 of Surah Al-Isra. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكَ وَلَا تَبْسُطُهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطَ فَتَقْعُدَ مَلُومًا مَحْسُورًا Do not tie your hand or shackle your hand to your neck. That is an Arabic phrase which means don't be so miserly. Don't be so stingy you hold back when you have to give and it's not going to cost you much when you have to reach out to those in need. And don't stretch your hand so much which means don't become so generous that you give away even your own basic needs. And Allah says strike a balance between the two. If you were to give everything perhaps you might sit at loss. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good balance and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who know how to give, when to give and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. We have out of human nature a habit that when someone swears us, when someone mocks at us, what do we do? We tend sometimes to give them back an even bigger swear word. It happens. So if someone calls you a swear word, you give them back an even bigger swear word. And sometimes if a person were to be acting in a derogatory manner towards you, we become even more vulgar, more abusive. But that's not a true believer. A true believer, no matter what others do, he carries himself as a believer. He carries himself with utmost respect. Someone swears you, don't stoop low to their level to swear them back because then your mouth, have, your mouth has now uttered the swear word as well. So remember, when people hurl abuse at you, respond in a very wise manner, a manner that is befitting a true believer. And this is the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 53 of Surah Al-Isra, according to the book Asbab Al-Nuzul of Al-Wahidi, and Suyuti has also made mention of it, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was once insulted by someone. They said some derogatory term. And you know, he was a strong man. He could have beaten them up. He could have hurled abuse back at them. And whatever he wanted, he could have done. Perhaps there was a time prior to Islam when he would have done that. But when it came to Islam, take a look at this powerful man. He was a solid build and he was feared. He could do what he would like, but he always used to ask the messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, what should I do? Is it okay? On a few occasions, he wanted to beat up some people who were disrespectful to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but he didn't do it before he asked Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always told him to calm down, to cool down. And this is when he actually calmed down a lot. So on that occasion, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what should he do? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited the verse. وَقُلْ لِعِبَادِي يَقُولُ الَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَنْزَغُ بَيْنَهُمْ Tell my worshippers to utter that which is the best. When you speak, choose your words. A lot of the times we have communication through the day, through the night as well. Some of us speak even in our sleep. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. That's how much we like to move our mouths. Remember one thing. You need to make sure that you use your mind a little bit as a believer to think what I'm about to say, what is the best possible way of saying it and then communicate it. It becomes an act of worship upon which you will be rewarded. Subhanallah. So to think before you speak and to choose the best possible way of communication, especially with your spouse, your children, your family members, your parents and the ummah at large, humanity at large is actually an act of worship. This is why no matter who you're talking to, to be able to speak is not a big deal, but to be able to speak correctly with wisdom, with respectful words in an effective manner, that is a gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of us has a brain. Sometimes we tend not to use it when it comes to the mouth because it's easier to speak than to think. We as mu'mineen are married, meant to marry the two. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us always beautiful speech. The rest of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it is the devil. The devil that likes to create enmity. The devil that likes to create these bad feelings, the hatred and all the problems between you. And a lot of these problems are connected to speech. The way we speak to each other, what we say and how we say it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us all. At the time of the Prophet وسلم, according to Hadith Muttafaq Alayh of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anh, he says there were certain human beings who used to worship the jinn. They used to seek help from the jinn kind and worship the jinn kind. And after some time, those jinn became Muslimin. They accepted the fold of Islam. They worshipped Allah alone. And these people who used to worship those jinn were unaware of it. Now what happens sometimes, People worship other people. People worship others who do not ask them to worship them. For example, there are people who worship Jesus, may peace be upon him. Allah says in the Quran that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus may peace be upon him, will be asked on the day of judgment. Did you instruct the people to worship you and your mother besides me? And he will say, never. 
I would never have uttered a word that I have had no right to utter. Not at all. It is Allah and Allah alone. He says, I worship you. How would I have instructed others to worship me? So who is the innocent one? It is Jesus, may peace be upon him. Who are those who are guilty? Those who consider him a deity and actually worship him. Because we are taught, worship your maker alone. The one who made you and the one who made Jesus, may peace be upon him. This is just one example. But there are so many examples of people who tend to worship other people whom they perceive as pious. Yet the pious person never ever said, worship me. Subhanallah. So it's important for us to know this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clarifies it in a very, very clear, in a very manifest way. Verse number 56 of Surah Al-Isra. Say, call all those whom you have decided or those whom you claim are gods besides me, those whom you worship besides me. Call all of them. Let's see. They don't own the removal of harm from you, nor can they divert it. They don't own removal of harm from you. Who is the owner of removal of harm? It's Allah. Allah will remove harm upon you and upon anyone else. And Allah is the one who will divert it. So Allah says, call them. Let's see. They won't be able to do anything on that day. And then Allah says, clarifying the position of those innocent saints, Allah says, They themselves are the ones, those saints who are being worshipped, the saints themselves are the ones who are trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are worshipping Allah. They are the ones who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking means to earn the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having hope in His mercy. And the verse continues, subhanallah. So my brothers and sisters, the point being raised in a nutshell is, we owe our worship to Allah and Allah alone. That is the basics of Islam. We owe our worship to Allah and Allah alone. When I put my head on the ground as prostration, it is only and solely allowed to be put for he who made me nobody else, nothing else and no one else, no creature, no human, no anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when I put my head on the ground, it's for Allah. When I engage in any act of worship, it is for Allah and Allah alone. And that this is the meaning of the term. You alone we worship and you alone we seek help from. We know that it is you in control. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding of this beautiful monotheism. It is actually the Abrahamic religion, the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam, given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has come down all the way to us. It is known as the religion of monotheism. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us and our offspring. Another hadith muttafaq alayhi by the same Sahabi, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. He says the Prophet وسلم, was once in one of the gardens on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara and some of the Jewish people who wanted to question him and cross question him in order to see if the answers were similar to those that they had in the Torah. They decided to ask him a question about the soul, the soul known as the Ruh, you know, the body and the soul. You have a soul and a body. So they said, Let's ask him about the soul. Let's see what he says. Because obviously, medicine cannot explain the soul. To this day, cannot explain. What happens to you when you sleep and your soul, medicine cannot explain. Science cannot explain. It's something Allah has kept for himself. We will perhaps understand one day when we meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is the instruction of Allah. So one of them said, ask him. And the other one said, no, don't ask him. Perhaps you might hear something that, might, that you might not like. You know, you might be embarrassed with the answer. So they said, no, let's ask him. So they asked him, O oh Messenger, O oh, oh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, tell us about the Ruh. So he remained silent for a while. And Jibreel Alayhi Salam came to him with verses, verse number 85 of Surah Al-Isra. They are asking you about the soul, the Ruh. What's the answer? What should you tell them? 
قل الروح من أمر ربي وما أوتيتم من العلم إلا قليلا Tell them the soul is with the instruction of Allah. The soul is by the command of Allah. And you have not been given knowledge except very little. Whatever you know is actually just a droplet. Our knowledge in comparison with the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot begin to compare. Subhanallah, we cannot begin to compare. In fact, our knowledge with that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we cannot begin to compare. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and we walk around on earth like know-it-alls. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Anyone says anything, especially about religion, everyone becomes a great, great scholar. Have you noticed that? People talk about accounts, they talk about medicine, you listen from the doctor. They talk about accounts, you listen from the accountant. They talk about plumbing, you listen from the plumber. They talk about anything else, they will listen from the, uh, those of the field, the professionals of the field, come to religion. Everyone becomes a PhD holder. Subhanallah. Everyone knows he has his own fatwas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Yes, it's important to know and it's important to learn. But remember, speak with sound knowledge or remain silent. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us learn. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. Brothers and sisters, this verse shows us that there are certain things that Allah has kept for himself in his own knowledge. Similarly, when it comes to something known as the separated letters, this evening in Taraweeh, we heard some of these letters. For example, What's the meaning of that? The true answer is Allah has kept that knowledge for himself. That's the knowledge. Subhanallah. No one can come and say, okay, it means this and it means that and so on. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Certain things Allah says we've kept it for ourselves. This is what is meant by belief in the unseen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us. This is the power of the Quran. Can I tell you the eloquence at the time of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was such that people used to be able to sing poetry or should I say utter poetry and rattle it out without even thinking much. And it would be exactly according to rules of Arabic language. And it would be full of deep meaning and they would get excited. They actually gathered in the evenings and they had these little clubs that they would get together in and they would start rattling these poems. And each one would be so amazed and impressed and the other would outdo the first and so on. This was the time of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where language was at a peak, although the bulk of them were unlettered. Unlettered mean, meaning they were unable to read or write. But that doesn't mean they were not educated in terms of language. They could speak and they were extremely eloquent and they had memories. At that time, they would memorize absolutely everything. They knew the lineage of their camels seven generations back. Today, we don't know our own lineage seven generations back. I challenge you. Anyone here knows their generation or their lineage seven generations back? I'll be the first one whose hands are down. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. And yet they had memories that were unmatched. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May he grant us a good memory for the right things. Alhamdulillah. So my brothers and sisters, at that time, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came with the Quran. The Quran was not poetry. It was not singing. It was something in between. It wasn't speech. It was something that was between the poetry and this ordinary speech. It's the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was full of meaning. It is full of meaning. It has in it power. It has in it so much of sweetness that if you are to hear the melodious recitation of the Quran, it would affect even the hearts of those who disbelieve. So when he came with it, people became jealous. Obviously, people would definitely become jealous. In Tafsir al-Tabari, narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, it is reported that some of the people of the book came to him. You know, they used to hear him. They used to see people around him getting all excited about listening to the beautiful words of the Quran. I can give you one story that happened in Makkah al-Mukarramah. Akhnas ibn Shuraiq, Abu Jahl, Abu Sufyan. These people were some of the leaders of Quraysh. They hated the Messenger وسلم, because of their che. They thought we're going to lose our position. We're going to lose our power. So we don't want to accept. We know it's the truth, but leave him. We don't want to accept it because we will no longer be the leaders of Mecca. 
So at night, very quietly, when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to go, uh, used to be reading the Quran at his uh, place of rest, and he used to read the Quran in a beautiful melodious tone. They tiptoed once, quietly, separately, and they happened to listen to these words, and they heard, and they were filling themselves, listening to the beauty of the Quran. And in the darkness, when he was finished, they were tiptoeing away. And guess what? They bumped into each other. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? And the other one says, what about you? And each one of them then admitted, hey, we came to listen to this word. Okay, listen, very, very bad. We're supposed to be the leaders here. Don't ever come again. You heard that? Never, ever. Okay, never. Next day, all three of them were there again. Subhanallah. All of them back. Same story, they bumped into each other. For the third time that happened, and then they swore their oaths. This is just showing you the beauty of the Quran, the impact it had even on the enemies of Islam. Still, it has the impact, powerful impact, the Quran. When it is recited correctly with proper melody, then you see the impact it has. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. However, my brothers and sisters, what happened is they started picking on him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is reported later on, they came to him and told him, some people came to him and told him, you see, you have this Quran that is revealed and we have the Torah that is revealed. It is a much better book. It has everything together. It was revealed all at once. It's come in book form and this Quran separated and it's not as uh, clustered as the Torah. And at the same time, we want you to stop saying this or if you don't, we will come up with a similar Quran and we will embarrass you. We're going to bring up something similar to this and we're going to confuse people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the challenge. What's the challenge? Verse number 88 of Surah Al-Isra. Qul, Qul means say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell them. Tell them what? Qul la in say if all mankind and jinn kind had to gather together in order to come up with something similar to this Quran, they will never ever come up with anything similar to it. Even if all of them assisted one another to try and achieve that. Never. We are 1436 years from the Hijrah. We are still waiting. Allahu Akbar. We are still waiting. Nobody has come up with anything even similar. And there are other challenges in the Quran. Allah says, Am Are they saying that Muhammad وسلم, fabricated this? Let them come up with 10 surahs, chapters similar to the Quran. Then Allah says, Qul Tell them to come up with even one surah similar to it. They didn't come up with anything similar to the Quran. They couldn't come up with anything similar to 10 surahs, 10 chapters. They couldn't come up with anything similar to one chapter. Then Allah tells them, If they are truthful, bring about even speech that sounds like the Quran. Let's see. They still haven't come up with it. Subhanallah. Where people are picking on the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at this, the power. I want to end that particular point by saying we Muslimin read the word of Allah. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, ask yourself, why does it not impact upon you as a believer? Why doesn't it change your life when it changed the lives of disbelievers who became Muslimin, the likes of Omar and Najashi? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace and blessings be upon them who cried, who turned when they had enmity in their heart just because they heard one verse of the Quran. Here we have entire chapters of the Quran being rattled out or should I say recited in such a beautiful way and we read it as well. And we, our eyes have not yet cried for the sake of Allah. We need to revisit our link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to look again at how we take this Quran and how we look at it, how we respect it, how exactly we carry it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand that it is indeed the most powerful word in existence.
Let's look at some of the other challenges. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, born in Mecca to Al-Mukarramah, we know that. His lineage, very well known. He was chosen by Allah, the best of creation, we know. There is no debate that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, afdalul khalqi wa akramul rusuli. The best of creation, the most honored of all the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without a doubt. A man blemishless, a man perfect, a man in every sense of the term perfection, he was the example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose him in actual fact. We are very, very honored to be from his ummah. In fact, we should be considering ourselves so fortunate to have been chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be following such a shining example. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know what they told him? They said, listen, we will accept what you've brought. But the minute someone says, but you know, they've got a problem. You know, normally when people apologize, they put a big butt in the apology. You know, I'm very sorry, but you know, it was your fault. That means you were not sorry. The minute you added a but, it's over. You're not sorry at all. You know, if someone says, I'm going to go, but uh, that means you're not going to go. Allah Akbar. Or you've got a condition that will delay the going. Something wrong. If you want to be genuine, just say, look, I'm sorry. Stop there. No ifs, no buts, nothing else. It's just an example. So they said, we'll follow, but the minute they said, but it means we're not going to follow. We've got some excuses. So they began, they said, we want you first to cause something from the earth springs to gush forth. Let's see them. We're standing and we're waiting, right? Cause the springs to gush from here. Let's see. And they're waiting. Astaghfirullah. Look at them insulting Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Allah says, we could have done it. They still wouldn't have accepted it. That's why we did not do it. Because Allah says, if we send it and we make it happen and then they don't accept it, we will destroy them instantly. But as a point of mercy, we didn't give them immediately because we did not want to punish them immediately either. Subhanallah. So he said, they said, and I'm going to read the verse, verse number 90 to 93 of Surah Al-Isra. The reason I'm going to read it, it's mentioned in Tafsir Al-Tabari by Ibn Abbas radiallahu an. The points are actually in the verse, what they said. وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا مِنَ الْأَرْضِ يَنْبُوعًا They said we will not believe in you until you cause the earth to gush in terms of springs. Make the springs gush from the earth. أَوْ تَكُونَ لَكَ جَنَّةٌ مِّن نَخِيلٍ وَعِنَبٍ فَتُفَجِّرَ الْأَنْهَارَ خِلَالَهَا تَفْجِيرًا Or we want you to have gardens, gardens of the date palm and gardens of grapes. And we want you to cause beautiful rivers to flow within those gardens. Let's see it, then we'll believe in you. Look at that. They are uttering that which is absolutely berserk, unacceptable. And then they continue to say, Or we want you to cause a piece of the sky to fall on us as you have been warning us. You told us punishment might come from the top. Let's see one piece of the sky cut out, drop on us. We want to see it. Or you speak of the angels and you speak of Allah. We want to see those angels and we want to see Allah. Bring them here. Astaghfirullah. Look at this. Look at the arrogance. Then they said, Or you, we want you to have a house full of adornment, full of all forms of expensive items. You're a man from amongst us. You live in a home, the average homes from among our homes and so on. We want you to be a top person who has a house that is full of adornment and everything else. And on top of that, they continued to say, Or we want to see you walking up, going into the heaven. We want to see you going up, you know, straight. We want to see that this man, okay, he's going to the heaven. And even if you go up, guess what they said? Even if you go up, we won't believe that you've actually gone up until you come down with a book from the heaven that we're seeing you bring down with a few angels holding it and you come and we want to read the book. Then we'll say, okay, okay, you're the messenger. So Allah gives them an answer. Tell them, praise be to my Lord. Subhana Rabbi, I am only but a human being who is a messenger. What are you asking me all these things? Subhana Rabbi. 
So this was a response given. The point I learned, when people are stubborn, you can do what you want, they won't accept what is right. May Allah protect us from such stubbornness. It might happen different levels in our lives, different people. Some people a social matter, some people a financial matter, some people a political matter, whatever else it may be, a religious matter. Sometimes the stubbornness is what destroys us. Learn to soften up for the right reasons. Learn to be a person who's not stubborn. When it comes to matters of this nature, where you're wrong, you're wrong. Admit it hands down and continue. Perhaps you will lead a better and happier life. The reason is, if we learn to become stubborn for various petty items, even major things, one day we will become stubborn regarding. Someone corrects you regarding religion. But because you are so stubborn anyway, regarding other things, you will not want to take the correction. So what happened? You need to work on your bad habit from now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection and an understanding. Then the last verse I'd like to speak about this evening. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this is made mention of in Tafsir al-Tabari, a narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. He, during the time of tahajjud in sujood, he used to make dua to Allah. He used to call out to Allah in sujood, in prostration. And part of the call, we are taught that you call out to Allah using all his beautiful names and qualities. You're asking for sustenance, you can use the name of Allah, Ya Razzaqu, O owner of sustenance. You're asking for cure, you can use the name of Allah, O owner of cure, Ya Shafi, and so on. Ya Wadudu, you're asking for, for love. Ya Ghaffaru, you're asking for forgiveness. Ya Allahu, the name of Allah. You can use any of these names, but you are still referring to one Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ, in his sujood, they heard him say, Ya Rahmanu. Allahumma ya Rahmanu ya Rahimu O oh Allah, you who is Rahman, who you who is Rahim. What is the meaning of Rahman and Rahim? They are referring to the mercy of Allah. O oh, you who is most beneficent, O oh, you who is most merciful. The difference between the two is Rahman is a term that is full of mercy that encompasses entire creation of Allah. And Rahim is a specialized mercy, especially for those who believe in Allah. That's the difference between the two. So the Kuffar, when they heard this, they said, look at him. He was the one telling us to worship one God. And here he's calling out quite a few. He's saying Rahman, he's saying Rahim, he's saying Allah. He must make his mind up. Astaghfirullah. Look at how foolish they are. So Allah says, verse number 110 of Surah Al-Isra. Say, use the name Allah, use the name Rahman, call out saying Allah, saying Ar Rahman. These are all the, the beautiful names of the same Allah. Subhanallah. So, from this I learn, and I'm sure the lesson is for all of us. Brothers and sisters, start learning the names of Allah, Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, His qualities, learn them. Put them into practice and use them to call out to him. Do you know what the hadith says? Inna lillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala tis'atan wa tis'ina isma mi'atan illa wahida man ahsaha aw hafidaha dakhal al-jannah. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many names, many, many names. 99 from amongst them. If anyone memorizes 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, learns them, protects them, puts them into practice, for them is paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us learn the names of Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrect us in the companionship of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Forgive our, all our shortcomings. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.